on world news tonight. India or Bharat? India grapples with its latest identity crisis over its official name as the world looks on. No show. US presidential candidates blast Trump for not turning up at the second Republican primary debate. Space records. NASA astronaut Frank Rubio finally returns to Earth after a record space flight. And lantern splendor. Diverse and colorful lanterns decorate Victoria Park in Hong Kong. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A uh, very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Thursday night. Tonight as well, we begin in India. When Narendra Modi opened the G20 in New Delhi, the world witnessed the Indian Prime Minister introducing himself not as the Prime Minister of India, but as the Prime Minister of Bharat. Some speculate this could foreshadow an official name change for the country, with supporters of the move arguing that the name India is a legacy of a colonial past. But opponents fearing it is merely aimed at furthering Modi's Hindu nationalist agenda. It's the latest controversy to hit the country. The government might change the name of the nation to Bharat, a Hindi word for India. Both the names are mentioned in the constitution, but it's India that's more commonly used. People have a mixed reaction to the proposal. Bharat summarizes the big uh, history of our country, which is like more into the Hinduism. They've created a proper diversion. Now when you ask anyone, they'll be just talking about the changing of the name. No one will remember the objective is to fight against unemployment. This controversy started during the G20 summit in early September when the dinner invitation sent from the president's office to the world leaders read President of Bharat. Also during Prime Minister's speech, the nameplate in front of him read Bharat as the country name. According to this historian, the Hindu nationalist government wants to get rid of the colonial legacy, even when the name was in use much before the British came to India. Where it suits the narrative, the idea of decolonization is being brought in, but where it doesn't suit the narrative, you're willing to keep idea that came up during colonial times. In the name of history, uh, it is actually the politics of our times that is, um, uh, that is playing out. But the opposition parties believe the sudden push for using a Hindi name by Narendra Modi is to exert his Hindu extremist agenda which can benefit him in next year's general election. Bharat and India were used interchangeably. What they have done is kind of brought it to a level where one is in conflict with another. They want to own that religion, they want to turn it into something called Hindutva and give it certain kind of ideology, certain orthodoxy. We contacted the ruling party, the BJP, for comments. They refused to talk to us on camera. But they confirmed that there are no plans to officially change India's name to Bharat. More than a third of the 120,000 ethnic Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh has fled the region as part of an exodus triggered by a military offensive which brought the enclave under Azerbaijan's control. A steady stream of vehicles make their way along the jam-packed Lachin Corridor, the only road out of Nagorno-Karabakh towards Armenia. These tens of thousands of refugees face an uncertain future after Azerbaijan reclaimed full control of the breakaway separatist region in a lightning offensive last week. I would like to return to Nagorno-Karabakh. I feel that after all these years, if we close the gap a little bit, we could find a common understanding. It was tough there, but it was our land for generations, Armenian land. And now we're here, homeless. It's a long and mountainous journey. This family fled with just the basic necessities, settling here in a motel in the Armenian town of Goris. Ruzana lost her husband in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan three years ago. She says she couldn't risk staying in Nagorno-Karabakh for her children's safety. There's no way to break us down because we are a strong, proud nation. We can barely accept that we're going through difficulties, but we couldn't sacrifice our children's lives. More than a third of the enclave's population have already fled. 
and one of the biggest movements of people in the region since the fall of the Soviet Union. Let's move on now to the road to the White House. Seven U.S. presidential hopefuls tussled over immigration, China and the economy at the second Republican primary debate, but save some of their most strident remarks to slam frontrunner Donald Trump for spurning the showdown. Let's take a look. Where's Joe Biden? He's completely missing in action from leadership. And you know who else is missing in action? Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added 7.8 trillion to the debt. And I want to look in the camera right now and tell you, Donald, I know you're watching. You can't help yourself. I know you're watching, okay? And you're not here tonight, not because of polls and not because of your indictments. You're not here tonight because you're afraid of being on the stage and defending your record. You're ducking these things. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You keep doing that, no one up here is going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. I think Trump was an excellent president, but the America First agenda does not belong to one man. It does not belong to Donald Trump. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. And now over in Australia, a man has been taken to hospital with back injuries after a crane collapsed at the Sydney fish market construction site. The new fish market site, a heavy lift crane lies crumpled and workers scatter. Big crash, yeah. The 50 metre arm slammed into the site below. It's one of the biggest building projects in the city and was swarming with workers. Somehow the crane came down missing bridge road by just 10 metres. I've been told by the police that they're satisfied that everyone's been accounted for. A 37-year-old worker was hit as he was walking underneath. He suffered spinal injuries and was stabilised at the scene for half an hour before he was taken to hospital. Three multiplex cranes occupy the site. Installing them over the water was a project in itself. The company touting the engineering in a promotional video. So they'll be lifting weights on this project anywhere from less than a ton um, up to 100 tons. Well, accidents happen, you know. Anything mechanical eventually goes faulty. It's a big setback for the redevelopment. It was due for completion next year at a cost of $750 million. Now the buckled crane will have to be removed and a new one erected. The French ambassador to Niger, Sylvia Nite, has returned to Paris. The return of the ambassador comes two months after a coup in Niger ousted its pro-Paris president and prompted a souring in relations between France and its former colony. More than a month after the military junta ordered his expulsion, the French ambassador to Niger has finally left the country. Sylvain Ité, along with six colleagues, first took a plane to Chad Wednesday morning before they were due to carry on to Paris. Members of the Nigerian army overthrew President Mohamed Bazoum at the end of July, bringing relations with France to an all-time low. The junta withdrew Ite's diplomatic immunity and visa one month later, but Paris initially refused to recognize the orders, saying only Bazoum's deposed government could order the envoy out. On Sunday, Emmanuel Macron told French media the ambassador would leave within hours and 1,500 French troops would withdraw from Niger by the end of the year. An announcement welcomed on the streets of Niamey. The French military must leave immediately because we really don't need them. We don't need them. They've been saying they'd help us for decades, but we haven't seen any change. So we don't want their help. All the French have to do is leave. That's enough, thank you. They can keep everything they have, but we have nothing to do with them anymore. Niger isn't the only former French colony now turning on Paris. Over the last two years, coups in Mali and Burkina Faso have also pushed out French soldiers, while residents there have taken to the streets to protest France's involvement in the countries. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. 
Now, just as the migrant dilemma over at the U.S.-Mexico border escalates, the Mexican President Andres Obrador called for a meeting of foreign ministers around Latin America to discuss migration as record numbers of people make the dangerous crossing through the Darien Gap. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador on Wednesday called for a regional meeting to discuss migration as a record number of people tried the dangerous crossing through the Darien Gap. He said a joint meeting was needed to not only protect migrants, but to combat the root causes that forced so many from Venezuela, Cuba, and countries in Central America to leave their homes. Y que nosotros tenemos que cuidarlos. Almost all of them pass through Mexico, and we must take care of migrants and protect them, but we must avoid an increase of the migrant flux because there are risks. Obrador said the meeting would take place in approximately 10 days with the foreign ministers of 10 Latin American countries. On Tuesday, the Mexican government's migration authority said it had deployed over 260 buses and vans to disperse over 8,000 migrants from the southern city of Tapachula, near the border with Guatemala, to other parts of the country. In recent weeks, large numbers of migrants have been crossing into the United States from Mexico, piling pressure on the Biden administration to stem the flow of people as the U.S. 2024 presidential election race begins to heat up. Now, a United States soldier who was detained after crossing into North Korea two months ago is back in American custody after Pyongyang said Travis King would be deported. The United States has secured the return of Private Travis King from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The U.S. soldier who illegally crossed the border into North Korea is in U.S. custody. Private Travis King made a sudden dash into the North in July. U.S. officials told reporters he appeared to be in good health and spirits and was very happy to be on his way home. The Swedish government retrieved King in North Korea and brought him over the border into China, where he was taken into U.S. custody. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. I would not want to speculate on any motivations uh, on the North Korean side, and I don't know that I would, uh, would, would, uh, would take from this that it heralds some breakthrough in diplomatic relations. Obviously, we're um, uh, pleased to have secured his return. We're very thankful for the government of Sweden for their work as the protecting power that they did to help um, uh, facilitate his transfer um, uh, back to the United States. At the time of his border crossing, King had been transported by the U.S. military to the airport to return to his home unit in the United States. Instead, he left the airport and joined a tour of the joint security area on the heavily fortified border between North and South Korea, where he ran across despite attempts by South Korean and U.S. guards to stop him. His shocking case triggered heated discussions within the U.S. government, but Washington declined to declare him a prisoner of war. Instead, North Korea appears to have treated his case like one of illegal immigration. Yang Yang has said he was seeking refuge due to racial discrimination within the U.S. Army. A spokesperson for King's mother expressed her gratitude to the Army for securing her son's release. A U.S. official declined to answer directly whether King would face a court-martial. Now, over in South Africa, an analysis of company data has shown that South African state utility ESCOM has been reversing a decline in emissions of particulate matter as it pushed aging coal-fired facilities to their limits amid a power crisis. South Africa's ESCOM has been polluting more as it pushes aging coal-fired facilities to their limits amid a power crisis. That's according to the analysis of the state utilities data. It showed that four out of its 15 power plants are breaching government emissions regulations designed to protect people's health. ESCOM officials have confirmed the violations but said making the plants compliant would take time. They also said it could undermine efforts to address South Africa's worst power crisis on record. For the past 18 months, daily scheduled blackouts have left most South Africans without power for up to 10 hours a day. Some 80% of South Africa's electricity is generated from burning coal. But over the past four decades, ESCOM has achieved a 75% reduction in emissions of particulate matter. That's largely ash and soot through a program of plant upgrades. Now that trend is being reversed. 
With power cuts expected to knock two percentage points off economic growth this year, ESCOM's senior environment manager Deidre Herbst said plants were having to be run harder with upgrades delayed. There is sometimes a trade-off made, she said. Company-wide, ESCOM's particulate emissions last year were at their worst levels since the early 1990s, according to an internal ESCOM presentation. The four plants breaching regulations, Matimba, Matla, Kendall and Creel, account for more than a third of ESCOM's total capacity. But two were emitting more than double the permitted limit of particulate matter in February, the most recent month of available data. The 35-year-old Kendall power station emitted an average of between 10 and 30 times the permissible limit. And it is the poor who are put most at risk. Three of the four violating facilities are located in the Mpumalanga province coal belt. It is among South Africa's poorest regions with nearly half the workforce unemployed. An unpublished government study found that more than 5,000 have died there annually due to the government's failure to fully enforce its own air quality standards. The Environment Ministry did not respond to questions about the emissions violations. Thomas Munguni, a Mapumalanga community activist, said poor communities living near ESCOM plants and coal mines were hit the hardest. We will not accept the thinking, he said, that because of load shedding, ESCOM can pollute as much as they want. And now an interesting NASA update. Record-breaking NASA astronaut Frank Rubio has finally returned to Earth, feeling the pull of the planet's gravity for the first time in more than a year. Object touchdown. This is the moment a Soyuz MS-23 capsule carrying NASA astronaut Frank Rubio and two Russian cosmonauts returned to Earth. Thank you. It's good to be home. All right, welcome to the team. They spent 371 days in space, with Rubio setting a new record for the longest continuous space flight by an American. To the next few months. The mission, Rubio's first space voyage, launched in September 2022. His mission aboard the International Space Station included testing space gardening, trying out a nutrient-rich space diet, and even 3D printing knee cartilage. His return, together with Russian cosmonauts Sergei Prokopev and Dmitry Patelin, comes six months late because their original spacecraft sprang a leak, so a replacement had to be sent up to get them back. And, uh, On September 11, 2023, Rubio broke the previous NASA record of 355 consecutive days in space, set by now-retired U.S. astronaut Mark Van de Hey. But Rubio is far from the world record held by Russian Valery Polyakov. He made the longest space journey ever, 437 consecutive days and 18 hours, between January 1994 and March 1995. Welcome back. Vietnam was lashed by intense downpours. For more on this story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. Heavy rain from a tropical depression hit northern and north central Vietnam. It caused flooding and halted traffic in the capital Hanoi and sparked warnings of landslides. Low river levels and hotter waters in Brazil's Amazon region have killed masses of fish. The dead fish were seen floating on river surfaces, contaminating the drinking water. Uzbekistan authorities stated that one person was killed and 162 were injured by a powerful explosion at a warehouse near Tashkent's airport. Israel reopened crossing points with Gaza, allowing thousands of Palestinian workers to get their jobs in Israel and the West Bank. Horrified families in the Bolivian city of El Alto exhumed the remains of their loved ones at a local cemetery. They've been exhumed after several graves have been demolished. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you had missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in Hong Kong as indigenous designed lanterns create a festive atmosphere as the mid-autumn festival approaches. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.